Okay, so um, welcome to the Virginia Cyber Range Weekly Workshop. This is, this is David Raymond, and um, this is our weekly coverage of a uh, little bit of um, information security news, and then um, the topic of the week for um, for our workshop, which uh, this week is, um, we're gonna continue, we've been talking about, whoops, I need to fix my slide here. We've been talking about web application vulnerabilities. And so last week we talked about um, SQL injection. Uh, this week we're gonna do a little hands-on with uh, command injection. Um, so this is another another um, web application vulnerability, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. <clears throat> so if you want to participate hands-on today, uh, you need a um, Cyber Basics environment in the Virginia Cyber Range, and um, so folks who are listening uh, either live or or um, the, the recording, most folks may already have a Cyber Basics environment uh, for their class if they're if they're using some of the Cyber Basics material. If not, we have a class set up that you can. Um, that you can use. Uh, this is the invitation code. So if you go to the Virginia Cyber Range, um, so if you go to uh, uh, console.virginiacyberrange.net, on the login, the little login pop up that comes up, you click in the lower left hand corner that says use invitation code, then you put in this invitation code and you will be um, created uh, an, a student account in a, a course that we have set up with the Cyber Basics environment. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to show this slide again before we get started, but if you want to take a screenshot or whatever and grab this invitation code, then you can use that to get uh, the environment that you need for this hands-on exercise. Um, <clears throat> so weekly workshops, um, we, we uh, spend about an hour a week, um, maybe a little less this week, but about an hour a week covering uh, various cybersecurity topics that we have about um, 12 or 15 of these already in our library. They're available on the virginiacyberrange.org webpage. Um, or they're also available on YouTube. If you search for Virginia Cyber Range, we have a YouTube channel and it's got uh, these uh, workshops uploaded and we've covered uh, various topics already. Um, if you'd like to see a particular topic covered, then please send an email either directly to me or to contact at virginiacyberrange.org and we will um, add that to our list of topics uh, to cover during the workshop. So a little bit of news, um, got a couple of news stories on a slide and then I'm going to jump over to a browser tab and cover um, one or two more stories just very quickly. Um, so this is more cryptocurrency news and um, you know I, I don't I, I, I talked a little bit about cryptocurrency um, last week I think and I, I don't mean to pile on with the cryptocurrency I'm just um, I'm just uh, um, Pulling up the the infosec news stories that I've seen recently that are that are um, that could be of interest and just so happens that over the last couple of weeks there's been a bunch of different news stories related to cryptocurrency. Uh, um, so here in this news story, um, we see that th there was a uh, an exchange. So digital here's the headline: Digital Exchange loses 137 million as the founder takes the passwords to the grave. Um, oops my pen not working today there it goes um, so this is a news story on ours ours technica and if you just you know do a little um, go to their web page and and uh, or google the, this headline you'll find it easy um, so this is a Canadian cryptocurrency exchange and a, a currency exchange is um, you know just what it sounds like right you can use you can go to one of these exchanges to buy and sell cryptocurrency of different types some of them have a um, a broad range of cryptocurrency that you can buy and sell. Some of them are dedicated to a specific um, uh, coin, digital coin. Um, this company, Quadri Quadriga CX, um, I think they uh, traded in a few different cryptocurrencies. So you could go there and use your, uh, you know, you could put, like take a credit card, for example, and buy Bitcoin. Or if you had a bunch of Bitcoin, you're looking to unload it, then you could uh, sell it. To, for for dollars at, at, at um, this exchange, and um, so these exchanges are uh, have been uh, have been problematic, right? So um, so you know we, we've we talked we've talked in the past about some flaws in um, you know cryptocurrency software that have caused uh, some of these uh, cryptocurrencies to be hacked and to lose a whole bunch of money. We've talked about um, 
the 51% attack where if somebody can figure out a way to gain f more than half of the computing power, then they can, um, uh, more than half of the computing power devoted to mining that particular cryptocurrency, then, then they can uh, s essentially take over the, the blockchain and um, then they can do some, f some nefarious things like they can double spend their, their cryptocurrency. Um, uh, so, so that's sort of some challenges with blockchain itself. And so like with any new technology, there's going to be some, obviously some bumps along the road while, while um, these kinds of challenges are, are sorted out. Um, now, another side of this whole story is these, these exchanges where people buy and sell cryptocurrency and um, they're often doing it. You know, if you remember, you know, cryptocurrency, the whole, the whole system is designed to be anonymous and it's, and you know, I have a, I have a, um, uh, digital certificate that will get me access to my crypto coin wallet. But if I, but nobody else can get into it, right? Not even, not even um, the owners of the cryptocurrency itself can't get into my wallet because it's because the whole thing is, you know, it's designed to be very distributed, very democratic, um, no central authority, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I have a, I have the uh, certificate that'll get me into my wallet and nobody else has it. And th there's been stories in the past of people who have lost their keys to their digital wallet and lost a bunch of money because if you can't, if you don't have the keys, you can't get in. And with modern crypto systems that are used in these cryptocurrencies, you're just not going to be able to brute force it in a reasonable you know, in somebody's lifetime, you're not going to be able to brute force it. So, so this is a case where, um, where this, this, uh, um, sole director and officer of this company Quadra CX, his name is, his name was Jerry Cotton, um, 30 year old, he passed away in December and it just so happened that he had, uh, the, 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 you know, $137 million in cryptocurrency stored in what's called a cold wallet. And so, a, you know, a cold wallet is just basically a system that's not connected to the internet. So they'll, so they'll use, you know, like a laptop and they'll, um, in this case it was a laptop and the, and they'll, they'll, you know, store, store the wallet on the laptop, um, put the money, uh, you know, in the wallet on the laptop and then unplug the laptop from, from the internet. And now nobody can hack their wallet, right? Cause it's not connected to the internet, you know? So, so you turn off the laptop, you put the whole thing in your safe. And, um, and now that cryptocurrency is essentially off the markets, completely secure, safe. No, no, there's no way somebody's going to hack your, your wallet because it's not connected to any network. But um, if only one guy knows the key and that guy dies, then then um, that money is gone, right? You can't get it back out of the out of the uh, out of the encrypted wallet that is offline. So so um, that's exactly what happened in this case. And, and of course, what you would expect is um, a company like this to not have only one person who has the key. Um, and you know there are ways to escrow keys to to make them so that. Um, so that you know, multiple people can have access to the key without, uh, you know, and still keep it secure. In fact, there are even keying techniques where you can make it so that you can't have only one person that can get access. You know, you, you have the, you can split up keys into multiple, um, uh, um, split up the keys among multiple people so that you know, two out of five, for example, have to be present in order to get access to the to the, you know, in order to decrypt the thing or. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's arbitrary. You can make it three out of five or th three out of 10 or whatever. But um, anyway, this is a, this is a situation where the, you know, the company clearly um, their business model might've been great, but their, um, but their technique for, for maintaining their keys was not good because um, the, the exchange loses $137 million. And what that really means is that the people who um, have, have money invested in this exchange are out $137 million. And so um, that, that is uh, sort of a cautionary tale. If you're going to, if you're going to run a, a um, you know, if you're going to have your own cryptocurrency wallet, um, uh, and, you know, and if you want your spouse to get access to it after you pass away, then you better make the key available somewhere to your spouse so that they can get to it. You know, if you're the only one who holds the key and something bad happens to you, then, then um, the money is essentially gone. Uh, okay, then, and then the next news story. Um, this is actually, a, this, is, this isn't particularly new. This has been the case since late uh, last fall, but um, this is a relatively new news story. Bitcoin is worth less than the cost to mine it. Um, 
So, um, you know, the way, the way Bitcoin works is that there are, um, you know, it's this distributed ledger. People are, people are maintaining the ledger across, you know, the world. And um, what's the incentive to maintain the ledger? Well, the ledger, maintaining the ledger requires computational resources to be applied. And in exchange for those computational resources, people are rewarded with fractions of crypto coins, right? Cryptocurrency. And, um, and it's the case now that, um, you know, Bitcoin has, uh, it costs more and more to mine Bitcoin because the way that the way it's, the way the system is designed, um, there are these periodic, um, there are these periodic points at which the, the computational cost to mine Bitcoin doubles. And it, this, it's all part of the, it's all part of the algorithm. Um, and it's done that way because there's a fixed total number of Bitcoins and they're designed to be mined at a specific rate over the next, I don't know, 20 years, maybe. I don't, I don't recall the exact timeline. Um, but there's going to be a point where there's no more Bitcoin to be mined. And um, in order to make the Bitcoin you know, last a long time and to make it more valuable, um, it takes more computational power to, to, to mine it. And um, so now it costs about $4,000 per Bitcoin for a miner to mine Bitcoin. $4,000 ish per Bitcoin and Bitcoin right now is trading at $3,600. So, so um, the, the incent, you know, the, this has some obvious impacts on the incentive to mine Bitcoin, right? So if, if it costs more to mine it than the Bitcoin is actually worth, then the fear is that people will, will uh, jump out of Bitcoin mining in droves. And if that happens, then, um, the whole system will sort of collapse on itself. You know, if nobody mines Bitcoin anymore, then the system can't continue to function. And um, now people are not doing that, not in droves yet anyway, because, um, because they, because they anticipate that the price will go back up. So it's, you know, they're basically taking the risk that, you know, I'm spending more to create this money now than it's actually worth. But, um, but the expectation is that, by the time I spend it, it'll be worth a lot more. So, so this, so this, the fact that I'm losing money now is okay. And you know, some people might sort of apply the sunk cost fallacy to it and say, well, I've already bought all this hardware to mine the cryptocurrency, and um, so I've already made a huge investment before I've even made a single Bitcoin. So I might as well keep mining it in hopes that eventually I'll be able to, you know, Bitcoin price will go up to a, to a sufficient level that I'll be able to, you know afford all this Bitcoin mining gear that, that um, I purchased. And when we say that the cost to mine a Bitcoin is $4,060, that is essentially the cost of the electricity required to mine a single Bitcoin. Um, so that's pretty significant, right? $4,000. So nobody's doing this on their laptop. I mean, mining Bitcoin requires, you know, people who, who, who do this have like server racks full of gear and they're running in a data center and they're spending a bunch of money on, on electricity and AC to keep their system running. And the, that $4,000 uh, figure, that's an average, worldwide average of the cost of mining Bitcoin. So you can imagine if you find a spot uh, that you can mine Bitcoin in a place that's uh, cold, that has very cold temperatures, then the AC cost will be lower and that'll probably make it a little bit cheaper. Um, and there are also some places where you can get electricity a lot cheaper um, than, than average. Um, so, so in some places, the cost to mine a Bitcoin is less than that. Maybe some people are still making money. In other places, the cost to mine Bitcoin is going to be significantly more than $4,000. And so they're, they're um, losing even more money. But I think that's something to watch. You know, at what point do people just say, hey, it's not worth it anymore. I'm going to get out of this game and start mining some other different currency with which I can actually make money. Um, okay, so that's the Bitcoin news of the week. Um, let me jump over to um, a browser. A couple of news stories I found just in the few minutes before I jumped on here. One of them is that... Uh, um, the highest court in Indiana, so the Indiana Supreme Court is uh, has a case uh, where they're where they're deciding whether you have to be forced to unlock your phone. So we talked, um, I don't know, last week or the week before about about um, biometrics, um, um, being able to fool biometrics, for example, being able to print a three D head and and fool a face 
face reader, uh, you know, uh, um, a uh, yeah, face uh, scan, or what is it? they call it, face ID, I guess, on iPhone. Um, and so, it's, so it, you know, it's been the case that the, the, the question of whether I can give up, whether I can be forced to give up my um, pin uh, because of the Fifth Amendment and, and and the rules are a little bit different with regard to um, biometrics. So in, in most places, it was, it was um, you know, it's been, um, it's, it's been the case that you couldn't be required to give up your PIN because of, um, because that would be you um, providing uh, essentially testimony against yourself. And so violation of the Fifth Amendment, whereas you could be required to use uh, thumbprints or, or, um, or face ID because it's biometric. So that's not testimony against yourself. That's just you using some feature of your of yourself um, and being required to use that. And, and so, um, so courts were uh, issuing warrants um, to officers where they could go to a location and force people to use their biometrics to open a device. And so there's a court case ongoing right now in Indiana that could that could sort of continue to iron out these laws about when can you when you can be compelled to use biometrics. And it's all about uh, you know, maintaining digital privacy of, of information. Um, so that, that I thought was sort of an interesting story. And this is a, this is one that um, <clears throat> I, I sort of got a chuckle out. A Apple just endorsed AT&T's fake 5G e network. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this, this is, um, so if you're, if, you know, if, if you uh, sort of track the technology trends, um, you know, 5G. What is 5G? Well, 5G is the is the natural evolution, the next generation of of wireless service for your mobile device. And um, and you know, but what is 5G exactly? And so you know, that might lead you to say, well, what is 4G? What is 3G? Um, and uh, and and really, at the at the ba at the uh, you know, in the in the end, the, those terms, 3G, 4G, 5G. They, those are simply uh, marketing terms, right? There's no governing body that says this is what 5G means in terms of wireless internet bandwidth, you know, speed, um, latency, et cetera. It's purely a, um, an agreement amongst, um, you know, the, these wireless companies that say, okay, we'll say that 5G, you know, we'll say that 4G means this in terms of bandwidth and latency and, and these different networking terms. And, um, you know, so, so it, you know, if they set a high enough bar, then, then when you make the switch, for example, from 3G to 4G, you, you probably notice that, um, you know, current, current wireless networks are just way more efficient than older wireless networks. And, and it's even the case that once in a while you might find yourself in a location that doesn't have, um, a 4G network, right? So if, so if you're connecting to a, a, a data network and it says LTE, you know, like my phone, my iPhone says LTE in the upper left-hand corner and LTE, uh, long-term evolution, that's a, that's a, um, that's a um, 4G standard for, um, for, uh, you know, a specific, that provides a specific level of, of wireless bandwidth. And in some, in some locations, you know, that, that don't have uh, as good of wireless infrastructure, they're still running on 3G. So if you end up in a place where you're, where you look at your phone, it says 3G in the corner, you know, you, you sort of know that you're going to get poorer um, uh, data service through that because, you know, 3G was lower bandwidth, um, you know, low, lower, higher latency, um, and it's just going to be a, a worse user experience. So the expectation from the consumer is that when we get a 5G network, everything's going to be great. You know, the bandwidth is going to be greater. The, the uh, latency is going to be less. I'm going to get my, you know, I'm going to be able to Google things faster. My email is going to come in without delays into my phone. I'm going to get better performance out of, out of real time, you know, like FaceTime video. You know, sometimes if you do FaceTime now on your LTE connection, it'll be jittery or, or it's not going to work. You know, with the expectation is with 5G that all that stuff is going to work with no problem. But again, 5G is simply a marketing term. So what does it really mean in terms of, you know, the, the, your expectation of the improved network capacity and the and so here's apple and at&t saying oh hey we're rolling out 5g well really they're not doing anything they're just they're just um uh um you know there's no you know there's, there's no there's no industry agreement or this at&t and apple 
um, rollout certainly isn't meeting the industry agreement of what of what 5G really is. They're just saying, hey, we're there. We're, we're rolling out 5G and we're going to put that on our devices and um, people should buy it, you know, because it's used for marketing. But um, really, there, you know, that the, the 5G networks really haven't been rolled out. There's no new... Um, uh, you know, radio in the phone that's going to make it perform better than the 4G radio. It's using the same radio. So, th so essentially what this story is saying is that it's just 4G with a different label on it. And that may very well be the case. And, um, and can Apple and AT&T get punished for this? Well, no, because there's no industry uh, consortium that's, I mean, there's no government uh, um, organization that says this is what 5G is. It's purely an agreement between these companies. And uh, so if they want to claim it on their marketing materials, then, uh, you know, they can essentially do whatever they want. And um, some customers will certainly purchase their device because they see 5G on it and they think they're going to get better performance. So uh, buyer beware is what I'll say about that. Um, okay, so enough news. Back to my slides. <clears throat> okay, so um, today we're going to talk about web application penetration testing, and then, so specifically, we're going to talk about command injection. So this is last week we talked about SQL injection. Oops, my pen acting weird. Um, this week we're going to talk about command injection. Um, there's some other web application penetration t testing stuff that you could possibly do with your students. It's a little bit more advanced. So for now, I'm going to stick with kind of these entry level um, um, web application vulnerabilities um, because I think they're sufficient to sort of make students understand what, you know, what the challenges are without, um, without trying to teach them a semester's worth of, uh, you know, web programming or PHP or whatever. Um, <clears throat> And then next week, we're going to start talking about capture the flag. So I'm going to spend a few of these weekly workshops talking about um, CTF exercises, you know, where, where teachers can find CTFs that their students can participate in, where students can find CTFs that they can participate in themselves. And then we'll talk about some of the different um, challenge types and how to approach them. And um, CTFs are a great tool for, for um, getting students interested in cybersecurity and Excuse me. So I, uh, I highly recommend that you um, try to get students involved in, in that stuff. <clears throat> okay, so once again, today we're going to do a hands-on exercise, and here's an invitation code. If you don't have access to a cyber basics environment already, um, and so go ahead and take a screenshot, and I'm going to move on, or you can pause the video if you're uh, watching the recording. <clears throat> All right, so um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my web browser. I have my web browser, because I killed it. And I'm gonna go to console.virginiacyberrange.net. My screen a little bit smaller, because I'm gonna pull up a hands-on exercise next to it. Okay, so here I'm gonna sign in with Google. I'm going to log in as a student. All right, so Virginia Star Range Weekly Workshops. If you use my invitation code, that's the uh, course that you're going to see. And then the only exercise environment is the Cyber Basics 2018. And here I'm going to uh, start up. Okay, so I'm just starting my virtual machine so that I can, so it'll be ready when I uh, come back to it. So these are the slides that we discussed um, uh, last week, two weeks ago. I guess we went through these initially, and I'm just gonna just sort of jump up and, and I'm gonna refresh our memory on what the problem is. You know why the why these why the websites are now vulnerable when they weren't in the past. This will just be a very quick review, and I'm going to jump up to the command injection vulnerability. So, um, if you recall, the early World Wide Web model, you had um, files stored on a file system, and so this file might be called index 
.html. And this, that's the default file name for, um, in most web servers, index.html is the default file name for the home page. So if you don't specify a, a, the name of a file in a URL, it's going to grab index.html and display it. And um, in the old web, you had a web server that essentially was just a file system. You know, it had web server software to receive HTTP GET requests. And then the GET request would ask for a file uh, off the file system. In this case, you know, if there's no file requested, then it would go out and grab index.html. Index.html is just a text file, and it looks kind of like this. It uses um, uh, HTML tags. You know, it's a, it's a markup language. And what it does is it tells the browser on the other end how to render the different things in the page. Um, so it, it, you know, makes headlines bigger. It makes, puts pictures in different places, et cetera. And um, so the web server would grab that file off the file system, return the file to the web browser, and the browser renders the page. Very simple. Um, no computation happening on the web server except searching the file system for the file. And um, certainly nothing being done on behalf of the requester. Um, no, no, no computation being performed on, the, on behalf of the requester. Now things are much more complicated, right? In, the, in this example, the, the uh, web server is doing database lookups on behalf of the user um, based on stuff that they type into a, a, a text box on the browser. And in the text box, you can type in whatever you want. And if you can fool the web server into, um, uh, you know, into, uh, you know, doing something malicious with that with that input, then uh, you sort of win as a as a web app penetration tester. And believe it or not, websites constantly still have these uh, problems with, you know, something poorly coded on the web server side. Remember these web these web pages and these web applications, they're just written by developers, and developers tend to be um, deadline driven so they have they have particular code that they have to write on a particular deadline and if they don't get that code done in time then their boss gets mad at them so what do they do they write code really fast they make mistakes and um, some hacker uh, before too long discovers those mistakes that were made and their web application has been uh, discovered to be vulnerable and that's that's often what's happening when there are these websites that get hacked and you hear about these large credential dumps where, you know, a bunch of user credentials have been, have been, uh, you know, maliciously dumped on the internet somewhere. So, and it's all about, it's all about web servers doing computation on behalf of the, um, on behalf of the person using the browser. And that, that generally is a dangerous combination. So I'm going to jump ahead here. Um, so, so command injection. So, I just jumped ahead here to slide number twenty-one in this in this um, slide deck. And the slide deck is the Cyber Basics um, web uh, web application penetration testing slide deck. So, if you type uh, in the virginiacyberrange.org in the course repository, if you type in um, you know web application penetration testing, then this slide deck will come up. Um, so command, command injection is when an attacker takes advantage of, of poorly sanitized input and that input is taken directly and passed to the command line using a couple of different um, commands that, are, that can be um, part of a PHP file. So lots of, um, lots of web applications are created in this uh, programming language called PHP. Um, there's other um, web applications that are created in a, a language called JavaScript. And with JavaScript, you can do something similar, right? You can, you can accept user input in a field on a web page, and then you can cause that user input to be part of a command that's executed within the, the, um, the web server itself. And um, so here we say, how do you prevent command injection attacks? Well, well, it seems obvious, duh, right? Don't make calls to exec or shell exec. But um, but in some cases, you know, you 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 have some web application where that's that's the natural way for you to get the the web application to do what you want. You know, you might have to get the server to to do something to to execute something using parameters that you pass it in a in a um, in a form field on a web page, and um, 
that's why those exist, right? If, if, if there wasn't a need for them, they wouldn't exist. And um, so, so the other way to prevent command injection attacks is to sanitize your input, right? So what that means is that you have to think about what you want that exec or shell exec to do for you. And, um, and then you have to sanitize the, the input that the user provides so that it can't be used to do something malicious. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll hopefully make sense of this as I continue to discuss. So we're gonna see, we're gonna see a particular um, um, vulnerable web application that um, is gonna take advantage of the ping command. And it's gonna ask the user to, to put in a, a um, it's gonna ask the user for an IP address. And then it's gonna run, the, and then the, the server is gonna take that IP address and it's gonna, and it's in a form field, right? And it's gonna run the command ping and then the IP address that the user provides in the web browser. And it's acting really weird. And um, so this is the thing that's that's put into the form field and we're gonna look at it in just a second. And, but the ping command, the ping is gonna be executed using exec or shell exec. I don't recall exactly which one of these commands is being used, but so, so the web application is gonna call the ping command. It's gonna give it the IP address to ping and then it's gonna give that result to the, to the, back to the user. And um, why would you wanna have a web page that does pings? Well, you know, this is kind of a toy example. It's simply to, to show, um, you know, how, how this might work. And it's using a, um, it's using a Linux command that folks should probably be familiar with by now if they've, if they've, um, you know, been going through these weekly workshops. So we know that ping is a command that could be used to, um, to, to have one host uh, try to communicate with another host and get a response to see if that host is active or not. And so, um, you know, so we'll use this sort of toy example in our, uh, in our exercise. And so I'm gonna jump out of this slide deck and I'm gonna to go to back to my, um, I'm gonna go back to my CyberRange account and I'm gonna log in to my Cyber Basics environment. And the hands-on exercise we're gonna do is called uh, Command Injection Lab. And you can get this out of, um, again, out of the courseware repository in the Cyber Basics um, content. It's called, um, whoops, Command Injection Lab. So resources required, uh, Cyber Basics environment running in the Virginia Cyber Range. So I have, the, I have the Cyber Basics environment up and running and I've logged into it using student student as username and password. So the first thing it asked me to do is to log in to DVWA. And so DVWA is a web server that's running on another host in the Cyber Basics environment. So, um, so here it tells me how to go there. HTTP DVWA.example.com. HTTP DVWA.example.com. And it takes me to this DVWA webpage. And then it tells me to, um, log in using username admin, password admin, username admin, password, oh, password is password, I'm sorry. Username admin, password, password. So now I'm logged into DVWA and this is, uh, this is darn vulnerable web application. And um, it has a bunch of different um, vulnerable web pages on it. And these are all listed on the left side here. So. Uh, we did uh, SQL injection last week. This week we're going to do command injection. First, before we um, before we start uh, testing this command injection vulnerability on this vulnerable website, um, first thing we're going to do. Let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading it. Okay, that's a little bit better. First thing we're going to do is we're going to set the difficulty level, the security level of the um, of this vulnerable uh, web server and 
right now it's set to impossible. And so one of the one of the neat things about this particular vulnerable web server is that you can change the difficulty level so that your you have to your if your students were were studying um, web application vulnerabilities and they sort of wanted to get better and better at penetration penetrating these vulnerabilities, then you can set the difficulty level to four different levels, and, and um, as you increase the level, it gets harder and harder. And the default level is the impossible level, so that's going to be really hard to to um, abuse the um, the, the vulnerabilities when this thing is set at that high of a difficulty level, but I'm going to change the DVWA security, and this is all explained in the handout that I'm showing on the right-hand side. I'm going to change the, vulner the vulnerability or the security level to low, and so here it says you can set the security level to low, medium, high, or impossible. The security level uh, changes the vulnerability level in DVWA, so low, the security level is completely the yeah, the security level is completely vulnerable and has no security measures at all. At all, its use uh, its use is to be an example of how web application vulnerabilities manifest through bad coding practices to serve as a platform to teach or learn basic exploitation techniques. And then medium, the setting is mainly given an example of the user of bad security practices where the developer has tried but failed to secure the application. And then high, it's even harder to attack. And then impossible, it's um, secure against all vulnerabilities, it says here. I wonder if that's really the case. Anyway, I've now set the security level to low, and if I look at the little indicator in the lower left-hand corner of every web page on this web application, you'll see that it's set to low. So now I'm gonna to go to the command injection page. So it says ping a device, enter the IP address. And um, so here I'm gonna use the loopback address. So, so I'm uh, in my, uh, oh, here we are, okay. So this uh, hands-on exercise, it kind of, kind of describes a little bit what a, what a command injection vulnerability is, and um, it has you set the difficulty level to low, and then it has you enter 127001. So that essentially makes a system ping itself. So I'm gonna put in 127.0.0.1. And so this, um, the, the web server is running the ping command, and remember, it's it's um, ping, and then whatever IP address I send to it. And so in this case, I put in one two seven zero zero one. So the response I get back from the server is the one two seven zero zero one, and then it tells me um, you know point zero one one milliseconds. So it, it pinged itself. It's very quick. So it's the latency is is very low. I could also ping. So remember, this is the web server that's doing the ping. I just had it ping itself. I could also have it ping um, my Kali Linux host that's running on um, the Virginia Cyber Range. And so I'm gonna use the ifconfig command. Remember, ifconfig gives me my, um, uh, the network information about my, my uh, host networking interfaces and here um, my uh, um, primary interface is this ETH0 device and the internet address for it is 10.1.145.164 and so I'm going to have the web server ping my Kali Linux box 10.1.145.164 uh, now if you're doing this your IP address is going to be different right because each one of these hosts each one of these Kali Linux boxes, um, it has a, um, a, a different IP address assigned to them, but the way to get your IP address is to do what I just did here, which is uh, open up a terminal window and type in uh, uh, IF config, interface config, and that will give you your internet address. Okay, so I've typed in the internet address, now I type submit. Now what, uh, what the, the web server is gonna do, it's not, so last time it pinged uh, 127001, uh, this time it's gonna ping um, 10.1.145.164. And what it got back was, um, it got back a response, and in this case, um, the response took 0 0.319 milliseconds. So um, if you recall, when I did that, when I had the server ping itself, the, the latency was 
0.011 milliseconds. Now it's up uh, 0.319 milliseconds, which is, which is about a third of a second. But, um, <clears throat> but the point is on the back end, the web server is just running this ping command using uh, the exec, using shell exec, I guess. And, um, and actually, I can actually look at the software that it's using. So if you go down to the view source button on the lower right hand corner of the, of the DVWA page, what this shows you is the actual PHP code that's running this thing. And um, it says, um, Target equals request IP. So the IP is uh, the thing that I that I typed in. So target equals whatever IP I, I typed in, at, you know, whatever the user typed into that text box. And then here it says command equals shell exec ping space and then um, whatever value was typed in, right? So this is PHP code. So the syntax is, is what it is. Um, but it, you know you can sort of look at it and, and understand what's going on. Um, uh, so it says determine OS and execute the ping command. So if, if this is a Windows computer, it's going to run ping with the target IP. If it's not, that assumes that it's a Unix computer. The command it runs is going to be a little bit different. Ping dash uh, C4. That means um, only accept four responses, and then it puts in the IP address. These essentially do the same thing. The ping command on a Windows server only gives you four responses. The ping command on a Linux server will go forever until you stop it. And since this ping command would be running on the server, you wouldn't be able to stop it ever. So it would never return. So what the server does is it gives this dash C4 and that means only give me four responses. Um, uh, th this um, this uh, web server is running on a Linux machine. So it's using the second version of the, um, of the uh, ping command. But it's just running the ping application, right? So just like I could do here in my uh, terminal window, I could say ping dash C4127.0.0.1. And so it gives me those, you know, it does it, gives me the result. In this case, when I send that 127001 to the web server, web server is going to ping that address and give me the, and it's going to spit the result out on the web page. So what's wrong with that? Well, <clears throat> if I'm malicious, what I can do is I can chain um, uh, executable commands together on the Linux uh, on the Linux system. So I, so I could, for example, I could put a semicolon at the end, and then I could do an ls-al. Whoops. And uh, what does the ls command do? Well, it lists the contents of the current directory. So here, if I say one two seven dot Oops. Sorry, I'm having some. Uh, if I type in 127.0.0.1, problem here. 127.0. Then I put in a semicolon and I say ls al. What happens? Well, the ping command got executed, right? So here's my pings, and I got similar response times, um, less, you know, less than uh, 0.03 milliseconds. But down here, what it did, what what the system did was it executed my ls command, but then it executed, or I'm sorry, it executed my ping command, but then it executed my ls, right, ls dash al, and gave me the listing of the directory on the server. So this is giving this is giving me server. This is giving me information about the server. Uh, in fact, I think I could, um, what would happen if I just said ls in here? Might not work at all. Oh, it did work. Okay. So it basically blew off the ping command because it wasn't provided an IP address. So it just skipped over that and then it executed ls. Um, could I just put ls all by itself? I don't think so. If I do ls all by itself, then it's going to try to say ping ls, which is meaningless, right? But if it says ping nothing, 
semicolon ls, then it'll do the right thing because the semicolon separates the ping command from the command following it. So it does my malicious thing. Okay, so um, so um, here it says, um, ping conjunction page, ask for an IP address, then it appends the output of the ping command, displays it on the web page of security setting on DVWA set to low. The web application is not confirming that the input is valid. So you can append further commands to the ping command using a semicolon. Try this by entering the following command injection uh, page text box and click submit, right? So this is what we just did. We, we put in the 127001 and then we followed that with ls-al and we got a listing of the current directory that the web server is running in. Okay, so, so you get the idea, I hope. Um, so try to use this technique together. Additional information listed both from the web server and answer the following questions. Display the server's IP address, subnet mask, and other local network information. And it says, what's the web server's IP address? Okay, how do I get that? Well, I could say semicolon, or I could put in the right, 127.0.0.1. Doesn't matter if I put this in or not. But I put semicolon, and then I could say, if config. If config. Okay, and <clears throat> what did I get back? Well, I got back the results of my ping command, of course, but I also get my uh, IP address and other information for my web server. Remember that if config is not running on my Linux, Kali Linux client, it's running on the web server and this, then it's returning the results um, back to my uh, web browser. And so the IP address of the web server is 10.1.151.199. Now yours is gonna be different because you're running a different copy of the DVWA inside your own cyber basics environment. In fact, each one of your students will get a, a different result because each student has their own copy of the whole cyber basics environment. But in this case, I've gotten the, um, I've gotten the IP address of the web server and it's 10.1.151.199. And remember, that's different than my than the IP address of my Kali Linux box, which is 10.1.145.164, right? So this is my client IP address. This is the server IP address of the DVWA machine. So why is that relevant? Well, if you if you can discover the um, IP address of a of a web server, then you know if you get all the if you get all this network information, then that may help you as a penetration tester. Um, exploit other uh, things in the network. What commands you use to get this information? Well, I used, I did the semicolon that I said, um, I said if config. What is the username used by the web server application? Ooh, that's a clever one. So how do I find that out? Well, there's this, um, there's this uh, uh, Linux command that you can use. Go back to my terminal window. There's this Linux command that you can use. Who, who tells me who else is, um, what other users are using this system at the same time I am. And if I say, who am I, it tells me my own username. Okay, so in case I forgot my own username, that would be sort of odd, but there it is. I typed in who am I and, the, the, and my Kali Linux box told me I was student. Okay, so now I can ask who is the, um, who, what's the username of the, um, that's being used by the web server application, right? So every application that runs on a system has to be run by some username and, um, and uh, the username uh, specifies um, or defines the permissions that the web server has. And so many of those usernames are not real users, they're simply um, administrative accounts, but they're set to permissions that won't let you do things that are too malicious if you were to be able to, uh, for example, um, uh, run command injection attacks against the web server. So here I'm gonna type in who am I? And here we see that the name of the user is www-data. What is the username used by the web server? And to get that, I typed in who am I? What command did you, oh yeah, who, who am I? 
Okay, what is the account name of the most recent account created on the web server? Hmm, what's the account name of the most recent account created on the web server? That's an interesting question. Um, how do you find that out? Well, there's this file that lists all of the account names. It's the password file. And it's actually stored in a directory called slash etc. So root of the file system, right? I'm doing a slash etc, et cetera, slash passwd. That file contains all the account names in the order that they were created because it's this, this file that when you create a new uh, Linux account in the system, it just appends the new account to that file. And, um, And um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, uh, you, uh, the, the name of the file is password. Does it store the passwords? No, it doesn't store the passwords. You would think it, that it would, but it doesn't. And there's historical reasons for that. And I'm not going to talk about it right now. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I, I want to, I want to get the contents of that file. And how do I get the contents of that file? Well, if, again, if you remember back to our lessons on uh, Kali Linux um, command line, if you want to, if you want to spit out the contents of a file to the screen, you use the cat command. So if I go back, I'm gonna, I'll do this example on my, um, if I was to say cat Etsy password on my Kali Linux box, I would get all these usernames, you know, top to bottom. Of course, the very first one that's created is root. Root has the permissions to do everything on the system. In this case, um, okay, there's the student account. That's my account name, and then some uh, other information about the account, the home directory, the account, the uh, the shell that I use, and what's not here at the end is the um, the hashed password because that's in the slash Etsy slash shadow file. But in this, in the particular case of this Kali Linux system, the very last. Um, account to be created is this thing called systemd dash core dump, which is um, which is a service account. It's not a real account that somebody would use. And how do I tell that? Well, if the, um, if the account ID is less than a thousand, that's a that's a key indicator. So if you use the command line utilities to create accounts on a, a Linux system, it's going to start assigning user accounts at one thousand and then go up from there. The other, uh, um, the other obvious identif identifier is at the end here. Uh, it for the um, for the shell like this one gives bin bash. For the shell for this account, it's slash s bin slash no login. So basically, it won't let that account log into the system. Um, anyway, so back to my DVWA. So I'm going to type in here cat slash etsy slash password and you see the output on my screen, and you see that the last account created was this MySQL account. And so the answer to this question is, MySQL command I used to get that, I cat, let's see, password. Okay, now, last question here, can you list the contents of the slash Etsy shadow file, which contains the hashed passwords for all the users? Well, let's see. I got slash Etsy slash passwords. Let's try cat slash Etsy slash shadow. Ooh, and I got no response. Maybe I typed it wrong. Let's try again. Cat slash Etsy slash shadow, shadow. No, oh, looks like I typed it right, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, it didn't work because um, because the only user who can list the contents of Etsy Shadow is the root user, and my web server is not running as a root. It's running as um, MySQL, and MySQL obviously doesn't have root privileges because it can't um, – can't cat the contents of that file. So, so the, the lesson learned here is um, 
some uh, beginner system administrators will run all their local services as the root user because it's really easy, right? I'm root. I'm just going to fire this web server up, uh, logged in as the root user, and um, and when then then it's going to run and people are going to get be able to get access to it and everything's good. But if you have a problem like this on your system, if I was running this web server or if the web server on DVWA was running under the context of the root user, then um, somebody could use this command injection vulnerability to get the contents of my Etsy shadow file and then they would get all the passwords, the, the hashed passwords, and then they could take that information offline and try to try to crack the passwords. And in one of the early um, weekly workshops, we did some hands-on password cracking and so we learned how to do that. And um, so that would be bad, obviously. So how do you run your web server as somebody other than root? Well, it's, a, it's all in the config the configuration of the web server. So there's a .config file for whatever web server software you're using. And um, you want to um, um, set that configuration file up so that, the, so that the user is not the root user. And then you want to let the um, web server start as a service. You don't want to run it at the command line. You want to let it start as a service. And if you do all that properly, you know, if you're a competent system administrator, then your web server is going to run using an account that's not the root account and people aren't going to be able to uh, do malicious things to it. Okay, um, last thing I'm going to show here is I'm going to say view source again. So here we see, um, again, we see this poor implementation of uh, a little, uh, um, you know, toy PHP program that accepts an IP address and then runs the ping command against the IP address. And we just saw why that was vulnerable. But what um, DVWA also lets us do is it lets us compare all of the different implementations. Excuse me. So down here at the bottom, low command injection source. So this is the low security version. That's the one we just looked at. If you go up to the next one, here's the medium version. What that's going to do is that's going to strip out that semicolon so, I, so it makes it more difficult for me to string commands together. Is it still possible? Sure, there's different ways, there's other ways I could I could do that, but this will prevent the script kiddies from getting past your medium security um, web page. Um, here's the high security command injection source. So here it's gonna uh, you know strip out a bunch of other stuff to make it even more difficult for me to do something malicious. And then if I go up to the um, impossible security command injection source, it's going to basically make sure that uh, the IP address is, is separated into four octets and it looks exactly like an IP address and anything else is going to be discarded and it's not going to work. Uh, okay, and that wraps up our session for this week on, um, on command injection vulnerabilities in uh, web server software. And so next week we will um, dive into capture the flag and um, we'll, we'll, next week, we'll just be a little bit of an introduction to capture the flag competitions. And then after that, we will um, have several weeks of um, how to approach different kinds of CTF challenges. So thanks for uh, joining and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks. <laughs>